Hello, everyone. I hope you are all in the room. So, uh, good day, uh, dear guests and colleagues. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the seventh online lecture of the uh, Peking Temple series on organization and management in higher education. Today, we have the privilege to uh, host Professor Peter Masson. Uh, who will deliver a talk on changing perspectives about organization and governance in higher education. So now it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce our distinguished lecturer, uh, Professor Peter Masson from the Faculty of Educational Sciences, University of Oslo, Norway. I also want to mention uh, Peter was my thesis supervisor when I was doing my master's degree in comparative and international education uh, at the University of Oslo over 20 years ago. So he is one of the most influential people in my life as he inspired me to pursue my academic career. Uh, Peter's research interests are in the area of governance of higher education and science and the relationships between higher education and society. He has participated in many national and international research projects, expert committees, and panels in higher education. He has produced over 250 international academic publications and is a globally leading scholar in higher education policy and administration. In today's lecture, uh, Peter will focus on how to make sense of governance and organization in higher education. So his lecture will be delivered in two parts. So this time, you know, it's uh, something new in our lecture series. So he will divide his talk in two parts. So in the first part, he will review various theoretical perspectives about university organization that has developed over the past 50 to 60 years. The second part will reflect upon the transformation of university governance and organization, as well as new perspectives on the transformation. Uh, so I just want to remind you, please, you know, through your questions already, you know, before the first part ends. So we are going to have a QA or some discussions before the second part uh, starts. Um, so now, thank you, Peter, and uh, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Yosha. Uh, it's a great pleasure and an honor for me to be um, invited to contribute to the lecture series. And I am looking forward to um, the discussion and to the questions and answers that you might have later on during the lecture. I hope you can all see the PowerPoint slides now. Yes. Uh, if not, let me know. Good. As uh, Joshua was indicating, my uh, lecture, the sixth in the series, focus is focusing on uh, changing perspectives changing perspectives on organization and governance in higher education. And in this focus, it relates to uh, previous lectures that have been given by uh, various uh, prominent colleagues and uh, the lectures that are still um, scheduled for this, uh, for this series. I will start, as Joshua was indicating, with focusing on the discussions, the uh, theoretical developments and questions around the organizational perspective, the organizational interpretation of um, higher education institution, more specifically the university. And um, then after about 20, 25 minutes, I will stop and then we have a, a, a chance to have a first round of questions and reflections before we continue. Let me start with um, raising the, uh, the key question that um, that I want to address. And that is what kind of organization is the university? And many images can come up when we think of um, the university, uh, either from our own experience, from world literature, 
from a university website. And here are a number of these images. And these images reflect that the university is a special kind of organization. At least that is what uh, throughout most of its history been assumed that the university is a special kind of organization. But in the recent discussions, the recent conceptualizations about um, the, the, the university as an organization, we've seen this um, raised as a question, not so much as a, as an, um, as a general agreement anymore. Um, so the special kind of organization, of course, has to do with the fact that the university uh, uh, combines the traditional and the innovative. There's a continuity and change, which also has to do with the fact that the university conserves what is, is past oriented in that sense, but also prepares for what comes uh, in its future orientation. It is a massive experience, as you can see in the in the picture here of the of the lecture room, but it also incorporates personal experiences and um, personal um, uh, life-changing uh, decisions. It combines an academic foundation in its primary processes of, of teaching and learning and, and research. Uh, it combines it with serving society, for example, through a third mission or through a knowledge transfer or social engagement. And uh, the university is also uh, argued to be a special organization in the way it combines and balances its basic um, uh, principles and values, especially academic freedom and institutional autonomy, with uh, some form of government control and market forces. So in our new understandings of the university, we can go back to the 1960s and to um, uh, the, the work by uh, Clark Kerr, uh, the famous um, president of the University of California system, who as a first uh, scholar addressed this question of uh, what do the changes that, that especially after 1945 have taken place, what do these changes mean for our understanding of the university? And he used the term multiversity, referring to the emergence of a new type of, of university that is replacing the university that we um, have known since the Middle Ages in, in Europe. In his in introduction and conceptualization of the multiversity, he pointed to um, a number of characteristics of uh, the, especially the large American research university, um, where uh, fragmentation, a large set of communities, um, units, activities held together by um, in, in other um, uh, publications he has uh, referred to uh, the common grief uh, of parking as, a, as an um, element that, that holds universities uh, together in the US. But this transformation, which started after the Second World War, is something that we have to take into account uh, as, as Kerr was, was very clearly emphasizing and a transformation that is regretted by some and accepted by many, as, as he said, um, and uh, understood uh, until now uh, by, by few. The first really uh, global scholar uh, of higher education studies that uh, was also recognized within uh, traditional academic domains, Burton Clark, also addressed the question of organization. And in his um, uh, book, his famous book from 1983, The Higher Education System, he um, very clearly described what the specific features of um, academic activities mean when it comes to the organization of the university. He refers to certain organizational shapes um, that are um, a consequence of the nature of academic activities, and these organizational shapes are then, al then also identified by Clark as causing peculiar problems when it comes to, to performance and understanding performance of universities and power. And more specifically, in his um, conceptualization of um, the, the university as an organization and higher education as a system, he started with um, looking at uh, elements of organization, specific elements. So the way in which the work of academics is organized in universities the way in which belief systems or culture influences academic activities 
and the very specific way in which authority is distributed um, within universities and between universities and, and public authorities, these are, according to Clark, among the key elements of organization that distinguish universities from other organizations. So in the 1960s to 1990s, around the work of Clark and others, um, this question uh, about universities of, uh, as organization was addressed around t uh, three types of discussions and conceptualizations. The first is, are universities organizations? If so, what kind of organizations is the second question. And uh, the third then is, how specific and incomparable to other organizations are universities in practice? And what is um, of, of interest to us is that a lot of research in um, organizational studies was done um, around universities, with universities as uh, the, the object of study. And uh, quite a number of organizational theories that, that are very well known, contingency theory, uh, resource dependence theory, um, the theory of loosely coupled systems, uh, organized anarchy theory, they uh, were developed um, and, and based on empirical re research that had uh, universities as, as objectives. So a lot of organizational theory uh, research was done within the university setting. Uh, and as a consequence, these theories are also relevant for understanding um, universities. And if we move to some of the efforts to um, in the development of organizational theory uh, in general, to uh, efforts to um, to uh, categorize uh, the, the research that was going on, we can identify um, uh, quite a lot of uh, categorizations where um, research focusing on universities and then generalized to uh, organizations in general, um, we can, we can uh, identify and recognize these, these theories. Uh, we can see, uh, for example, at the efforts by Astley and Van der Ven from uh, 1983, to um, uh, identify two dimensions, uh, macro versus micro as one dimension uh, for organizational studies and a deterministic versus a voluntaristic orientation as another dimension leading to four categories of um, organizational theoretical studies. Uh, the natural uh, selection view is one category which assumes that environmental competition determines organizational change Another macro level um, category is a collective action view uh, where uh, schools like human ecology, uh, political economy, pluralism can be identified where we can um, uh, uh, assume that change is caused by collective bargaining, by conflicts, by negotiation, by compromise uh, with a manager um, role as interactive. And, uh, these these uh, dimensions of organizational theory, the schools, the structure, the change, the behavior, the manager role are also identified for uh, micro level oriented uh, organizational theory approaches, which also uh, are uh, distinguished in a deterministic um, a school and a voluntaristic school. And the latter, the voluntaristic micro level orientation, there we find um, the strategic choice um, uh, emphasis, action theory, strategic management, etc. So these kind of, of efforts to uh, categorize the rich work and the valuable work um, that was uh, going on in uh, organizational theory at the beginning of the 1980s also uh, is of relevance for uh, our um, organizational studies in, in higher education with um, an, an interest in, in um, distinguishing macro and micro uh, level studies focusing uh, the latter on individual uh, universities and looking at um, the the impact of the environment um, the public authorities uh, or important stakeholders etc and the uh, role of um, of managers of uh, specific actors within higher education institutions if we take that as a starting point then we can move from the early 1980s and the discussions, uh, the 1960s to 1990s, to an important publication from 2000 by Brunson and Celine Anderson, which was um, uh, aimed at an, um, an analyzing and discussing 
the uh, rationale of public sector reforms of, of organizations. And according to Brunson and Celine Anderson, the reforms that took place in the 1990s at the end of this period um, that, that I uh, focused on where the discussion in higher education was on um, the nature of the university as an organization, according to, um, to these two authors at the um, uh, second part of the 1990s, we can start to identify the reforms that are aimed at um, um, constructing uh, organizations and, and developing them into more complete organizations, amongst other things in, in higher education. And the starting point was that uh, universities, uh, colleges at that time in, in many countries in the world were uh, functioning not at an optimal way and were not contributing in an effective enough way to society's needs. And according again to these two authors, uh, the reforms assumed that by constructing or reinforcing or installing identity, hierarchy and rationality in public sector organizations such as universities, these universities would become more complete and more effective and more uh, relevant um, to society's uh, uh, um, needs. And identity then has to do with um, the um, the development of specific uh, institutional boundaries of having collective resources instead of resources uh, um, uh, allocated uh, to, to, to units without the central uh, leadership having an, um, an impact on that. Uh, it had to do with enhanced autonomy so that the um, organization, the university could develop a strategic profile uh, in, in essence, it had to do with uh, becoming more special and um, um, with a clear identity as an organization. Hierarchy had to do with management, with uh, the, uh, the relationship from top down to, 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 to the bottom units. Uh, coordination is important, control is important, and rationality has to do with objectives, with goals, and with measuring results. These elements, I'm sure you all recognize from uh, reforms um, of the last uh, 25 to 30 years. And Brunson, Brunson and Celine Anderson identify in their work then uh, three types of organizations, the actors that are fully fledged um, and complete organizations that are capable of being an entity that functions as a coherent social actors, as agents that are organizations that, that are more instruments for other actors. Uh, and arenas where the members of an organization are in essence driven by or guided by external interests and where uh, local control is, is relatively limited. And according to um, these two authors, universities are arenas and the reforms were aimed at uh, developing them into agents, if not actors. If we then um, continue with um, the, the key question from uh, Brunson and Celine Anderson, that is, have public organizations, uh, public sector organizations such as universities indeed developed into more complete organizations? Were the reforms successful? And quite a number of scholars in higher education studies have taken up this question and have studied over the last 20 years the impact of, of public sector reforms on universities and um, have analyzed, examined the extent to which around identity, around hierarchy, around rationality, universities have developed into more complete organizations. So this question is on the table and it is addressed in uh, prominent uh, publications. Krücken uh, will uh, contribute to the um, lecture series uh, later on. Um, and, and Maya, they have um, discussed the notion of strategic organizational actorhood. So universities as um, organizations that need to become more tightly coupled, need to become uh, more integrated and led by uh, strategic managers. Uh, so this was another uh, approach and a specification of the approach by Brunson and Saline Anderson, emphasizing that reforms wanted to uh, develop universities um, and other public sector organizations into actors, integrated actors, away from the loosely coupledness that characterized universities since the Middle Ages. And Musselin, in a recent article, 
has uh, come uh, to a rather uh, straightforward conclusion uh, by arguing that universities were finally transformed into organizations by public management reforms because uh, their boundaries were better defined, hierarchical relationships were strengthened, and rationality became more important in decision making. So this is, let's say, a conclusion uh, from some years ago based on research done uh, by um, quite a lot of, of uh, scholars, as indicated, uh, with the conclusion, yes, universities have become more complete. But I would raise this, this question because I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced, like Musselin, that universities have indeed transformed into complete organizations and that they have uh, become uh, in all respects, more integrated, um, more uh, strategic, uh, more hierarchical, uh, more rational. And here I want to point to uh, one of the transformations that um, is going on um, and the impact on universities as organizations of the transformation around the key concepts of competition and collaboration. We've just in Oslo with, with our team well, also Björn Stensacker, a previous speaker in this series, is, is involved uh, a study on the development of competition and collaboration uh, worldwide in higher education, analyzed uh, institutional documents, websites, did a number of interviews, and um, to um, uh, share with you some of the, of the findings of that study, uh, what we can um, uh, identify in line with um, the uh, emphasis in the literature is that uh, competition has uh, intensified. We've seen the emergence of the university as a competitor, where previously competition in science, in higher education and research took place between countries uh, and between individual academics and their teams, but not so much between universities. But the rankings and um, the, the introduction, the development of scientometrics, of bibliometrics, of uh, the use of uh, performance indicators uh, in, in global rankings, and the uh, interest of governments in the performance of their university system has uh, contributed to the university emerging as a, as a competitor. But in the competition, we um, have to make the distinction between the continuous national competition and the intensifying national competition for resources, funding, st students and staff, and the global competition for status. We would argue that the global um, competition for resources is limited. Most universities still get most of their funding uh, from um, their national authorities and even within the European case where the European level, European uh, Union, uh, has uh, funding programs for research and education. A, the funding is, uh, is coming in essence from the member states and B, uh, compared to the national uh, level, it is still um, not marginal, but it's not as important at the national level. But in other parts of the world, even the, the most prominent global universities, they get most of their resources, their, their funding, their students and staff um, uh, from their national context. But the, um, the global competition that universities are involved in is for status. But um, the emphasis on competition in the academic literature has kind of um, neglected the, the growing focus on collaboration that universities are involved in and the changing nature of collaboration, where we've seen, amongst other things, a shift from memoranda of understanding with um, hundreds of universities around the world to uh, a few strategic partnerships and, and membership in a few strategic alliances. Uh, in, in Europe, we can identify the European University Alliances uh, within the European University Initiative, but there are also other strategic alliances um, that universities are involved in and strategic partnerships are not only between equal uh, partners uh, aimed at strengthening their competitiveness, but also between universities in the north and the global north and in the global south, uh, where one of the aims is, is to contribute to strengthening capacity in the global south. And that um, uh, relates to or, or is an um, indication of the fact that strategic collaboration serves um, a number of purposes and um, uh, not only uh, is aimed at strengthening um, the competitive uh, position of universities, it is also a very strong um, dimension 
in the area of the university's contribute, contribution to sustainability and the realization of the sustainable development goals. So universities use collaboration strategically also for other purposes than strengthening their competitiveness. And that then uh, as the final slide and the final reflection before we can have a little break and our first round of, of questions and, and, and uh, discussion, that then relates to um, the, the specific nature again of the university, as we discussed um, in, in, um, in this book from 2007, University Dynamics and European Integration. So the starting point that you also find um, addressed in, in, in the academic literature is that under some circumstances, organizational change in universities is determined by environmental processes of competitive selection. Think back of the slide of Esli and van der Ven, the, the four categories that I showed you, the, the, the macro level and the deterministic orientation, environmental processes, lead to competitive selection and determine which universities are doing well in competition and which are struggling. But uh, at the same time, there is a lot of emphasis in the academic literature on a strategic choice, on the voluntaristic orientation at the micro level of individual universities, of the potential of their institutional leaders, um, the uh, executive, but also academic leaders, by making uh, effective strategic choices um, they contribute to uh, the way in which uh, change has taken place in their institution. So we would argue that both ex explanatory, uh, we have argued that both explanatory frames are very prominent, but that organizational change in universities routinely involves a much larger repertoire of standard processes and in uh, contemporary settings often takes place in a very complex ecology of actors, of processes, of determinants, for example, around competition and collaboration that makes uh, um, a an, um, relatively straightforward um, um, approach, uh, assuming that competitive selection or strategic choices will determine change is too simplistic. So we have to uh, develop um, and uh, analytical approaches that do justice to this complexity and to the complex ecology of actors, process and determines that, um, that lead to organizational change in universities. So, so far, so good. Uh, reflections on organizational change, uh, discussion um, uh, that are in the academic literature. And um, I would I now like to open up for a first round of, of questions, reflections, and comments before we go further with the second uh, part. Hello, uh, I was muted. Uh, thank you, Peter, uh, for for such a comprehensive review of uh, uh, organizational perspectives on higher education. Uh, the the discussions or the uh, the review is also very nicely related to many other. Uh, lectures uh, presented before in the series, as uh, Peter has already indicated. Uh, as I, I already mentioned, so we are going to have a break uh, in between the first and the second uh, part, but uh, we are not going to have a coffee break. So try to be, be awake and with your questions, so we have some uh, some discussions. Uh, so I haven't seen anybody, you know, already uh, put your question here. Uh, but uh, if you you want, you know, let's be more efficient. You can just uh, you know raise your hands. Uh, okay, we already have a question. Uh, so uh, now I invite uh, Ahmed. Uh, could you please uh, uh, just uh, unmute yourself, and uh, you can directly ask your question to Peter. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I was just uh, wondering about uh, Minsberg's uh, claim that uh, organizational uh, universities as professional uh, uh, structure, what he uh, calls um, so professional uh, bureaucracy. Um, I was wondering uh, your classification uh, and the literature is is quite different. So I was wondering uh, what do you think about that uh, professional bureaucracy? Uh, mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you for your question. Um, of course, um, the work by Mintzberg has been influential also in, in higher education research. I could have mentioned it as, as um, uh, and, and uh, interpreted um, within the, the classification of, um, of Ashley and Van der Ven. Um, but the, the work of, of Mintzberg isn't uh, first and foremost um, aimed at universities. I could have also gone a bit more in a bit more detail into the discussion and the conceptualizations of loosely coupled systems, universities as loosely coupled system. So there are various um, valuable and relevant um, uh, theoretical developments in, in organizational theory in general. And of course, we can all um, identify universities as professional bureaucracies with the, the way in which um, Let's say the um, uh, Mintzberg has conceptualized it with a very large uh, professional uh, bottom. Um, the way the, the professional professionals at the bottom, if I may use the word bottom, are um, linked to the um, strategic uh, leadership of of the the institution or the organization. Um, so so it's it's another um, effort to conceptualize the way in which um, organizations that have a strong uh, professional foundation uh, can be interpreted. But I, I think it's, it's, um, it's rather general and said it, it doesn't only apply to universities and Minsberg's uh, later work, there is taken some distance from his earlier uh, conceptualizations around professional bureaucracies. And he's also been quite critical about uh, strategic management in organizations and, and developed alternative approaches. Um, so yes, uh, thank you for reminding me um, of um, of Minsberg. I I um, I'm fully um, agree with you that uh, he has uh, developed a conceptualization professional bureaucracies that has been used in discussion on higher education and has also been uh, used to um, to answer the question: Are university special organizations in a positive way? Thank you, uh, Ahmed, for the uh, question. So now we also have a, a brief discussion about a new perspective. Uh, now, uh, I invite Paul, please. Uh, you can uh, direct ask your question. Uh, thank you, Peter, for, for the wonderful introduction. It's uh, quite insightful and also uh, summarized. Um, I mean, it, it's such a short, uh, brief discussion uh, summarized. The, the change in the conceptualization of university as an organization during the past 60 years. Thank you very much. I guess my question is, um, because you, you introduce idea, especially a Muslim idea about, you know, uh, universities already transformed into complete organizations uh, regarding the identity and also hierarchy and the rationality introduced into universities. But we also read Carl Wick, you know, um, his idea about, you know, the, the differences between tight coupling and loosely coupling and also the decoupling, uh, decoupling. So the, the, the question is, uh, has the university already changed, you know, this kind of uh, loosely, from the loosely coupled organization already transformed into the tightly coupled organization? Um, or it just, uh, you know, the, the degree of change, uh, so to speak, so the university was still considered as loosely coupled, but with this kind of vertical kind of uh, uh, more uh, tightly coupled uh, in the sense. I guess the, the, the question is, um, has the fundamental organizational mode changed so far, or it just become the degree of extent of, you know, the, the coupling uh, changed? Because, you know, in the Muslim uh, paper in 2018 or 2021, she mentioned the four fundamental models of universities. One is collegial and then political and then bureaucracy. And then the last one was organizational anarchy, right? So she's kind of still consider a university as uh, with a weak technology and also loosely coupled. So in a sense, has this already changed? So university moved to, towards more like a, how do we say, a uh, complete organization? <laughs> yeah, so so I wish to hear your opinions about this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this is partly what I will address in the second part of the, of the presentation. So I'll come back to it. But I, I think that an, a very important 
a basic feature of universities that has to do with the production process. And, and in my view, the production process isn't weak, but the production process in universities is unique because it's unpredictable when it comes to the outcomes. We all know that if we enroll 300 students at the bachelor level in a specific program, it doesn't matter in, in which discipline, it is impossible to predict with 100% certainty how many of the students will have uh, graduated in three years or in three and a half years or how many uh, credit points will have been produced. Um, and if we go to research, also in research, um, we can and we do make the investments, mainly public, um, that are needed in, in, um, in uh, let's call it curiosity-driven research. Um, but we don't know um, what the outcomes will be. So the, the uh, production process of the university is characterized by uncertainty and a lack of control when it comes to the outcomes. And in that sense, it's different than a shoe factory where the production process uh, can be uh, controlled and where uh, given uh, the resources that are needed and the processes that are taking place, it is uh, with a, a large um, um, level of certainty possible to predict how many shoes are going to be produced. Um, there, the uncertainty is much more on the market and the market demand, but you can uh, control the production process, which is not the case in the university, at least not when it comes to outcomes. So when we take that as a starting point, um, and at the same time, take into account what uh, Clark Kerr started to address in the early 1960s, that the reason that universities are changing and are pressured to change is the massification, the, the growth on the one hand, the growth in student numbers, growth in the number of institutions, in uh, staff um, uh, appointments, um, in uh, the budgets of the universities um, and, and colleges on the one hand, and on the other hand, the growing importance of knowledge, the, the concept of knowledge society and knowledge economy. So the, the growing importance of universities on the one end and the massification leading to um, increasing cost at an inflation plus, and in some would say an inflation plus plus rate, um, has led to pressures on the university to uh, get more control over their, the outcome of their production process. And the assumption is that by strengthening institutional leadership, by um, um, creating uh, executive forms of governance, that um, the university leadership will be able to uh, develop a larger control over uh, the academic activities, especially when it comes to outcomes. I do think that we see changes in the university that reflect this. There is more hierarchy and there is more focus on mission and on, on goals, and there is more uh, focus on identity, but it hasn't led necessarily to a greater control over the outcomes of the production process. So in that sense, I think uh, universities, and that is what I uh, refer to with this ecology, universities face the need to do justice to the growing complexity as a consequence of massification on the one end and the growing importance of knowledge on the other end. So they, they do need to um, uh, develop uh, more professional ways of running the organization. But on the other hand, they also need to do justice to the nature of the production process. Uh, which is impossible to control 100%. So the, the change that you are referring to has to do with uh, universities trying to find new balances between professional leadership and management on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, the continuous uh, professional academic control over uh, the um, basic processes around teaching and uh, research, especially when it comes to, to content. And in that context, what we now see uh, around the world, there's also a discussion around academic freedom, around institutional autonomy. What do these basic values, these basic principles mean when universities try to balance the pressure for more executive uh, leadership on the one hand and the need to uh, continue to do justice to the specific nature of its production process? Thank you. Thank you, thank you for the discussion. Uh, as Peter said, you know this this might be a topic Peter will cover in the in the second part. But this is a very crucial concept, you know, the uh, loosely coupled, decoupled, or tightly coupled. But there's also uh, issues about you know uh, 
how the uh, somehow university leaders are aware of this nature of uh, that university is a loosely coupled organization because this loosely coupled has uh, the advantage of uh, making university be more resilient and also can resolve potential uh, potential tensions. So this is also uh, uh, something I think Peter will talk about, you know, so somehow whether the university leaders, they somehow have some kind of theoretical concept when running, running the university. So they are aware of, you know, what are the, uh, the, the advantage of the university being in certain characters. But I do not want to take more time. I, we have Johannes, has, uh, Johannes, are you there? So you can uh, yes. turn on your speaker. Thank you. Um. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Peter Marcel. Uh, my name is Johannes Mahari. I'm uh, from Tampere University. Uh, I'm one of your students. Uh, I'm part of this team uh, master's program in 2010, class of 2010. So I have been following your work since then. Uh, my question is, um, about the identity of university, the, 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 depicting university as special organization. As we all know, universities have been evolved over the years and especially they have been adopting business management models. And now they, they are looking more uh, business companies than the, the traditional universities that we need to know. And my, my question in here is that they are losing their identity and we, we still, but and on the other hand, we are using the old argument that, uh, for example, you mentioned Burton Clark and others uh, that, that they, they depict, they, that, that they try to depict universities as special organization. But how valid are these arguments now? Because now if we have universities, they look like more business companies, but we are also claiming they are special organization. My question is how valid this evidence, these arguments are now, the ones that we've been using for years. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Johannes. Uh, thank you for your question. And it's good to see you. Um, the, the issue at stake, as Johannes was addressing, is um, the interpretation of the change that has taken place, because no one uh, will deny that universities uh, as organizations have gone through uh, important changes. But the, the question, one of the questions is whether these changes have uh, affected and are changing the university as a whole into a kind of um, a public uh, knowledge or, uh, founded uh, business um, organization, or do we see um, a, a variety of adaptations um, which, um, uh, are um, representing different types of identities uh, within the university. So that the, the notion of a multiversity, but different than the way Clark introduced it in 1963, the, the notion of a multiversity uh, might still apply to the current university where part um, uh, presents an identity that resembles an, uh, a public business corporation, uh, but other parts uh, still uh, very much resemble uh, the traditional uh, uh, republic of scholars all within the same organization. And that relates um, to, uh, to the previous question about coupling. Um, why introduce the, the notion of loosely uh, coupled systems in his article in 76, based on the work by Jim March and, and Olson and others, um, and uh, argue that coupling uh, is as important a concept for understanding organizational uh, dynamics and organizational change as, for example, decision making. The, the challenge with the notion of loosely coupling is that it's uh, not easy to, to uh, operationalize and use in, in empirical research. But um, there is uh, important work going on um, also um, uh, currently looking at couplings and how uh, various couplings um, are changing in the university and where we might see a development towards more tightly coupling and a development um, that continues to be loosely coupled. 
Um, and back to the question on identity, um, is the university changing into a business corporation? Uh, I would say uh, definitely no. The university isn't a shoe factory, isn't like a shoe factory. And as I um, uh, indicated before, the production process is unique. If you want to change the university into uh, an organization that, that truly resembles a business corporation, you have to change the production process, and that would be the end of the university. Now, I'm uh, saying it in a very simplistic and, and uh, dramatic way, but the strength of the university is uh, the way that it's, it has been for um, at least 200 years, the emergence of the research universities in Germany, the institutionalized domain for handling knowledge in any society. Recent research also shows that um, practically every country in the world now there's at least one university that contributes to global uh, knowledge development. And these um, universities within their national, uh, their regional and global context are still specific organizations. And the fact that they can contribute and do contribute to knowledge production and uh, related to that, uh, the dissemination and transfer of knowledge has to do with their unique characteristics. The, the um, features that Clark identified the building blocks, knowledge as a building block, with the sociology department being um, very loosely coupled, if coupled at all, to the physics department, uh, the developments uh, in disciplines and the way in which they are related to universities and colleges, they all are still features of a, a, science, um, uh, a science institution that is unique and has a very special place in society. Transformation that are taking place are important, but until now, in my view, they haven't um, really changed the basic features and the basic unique uh, identity of, of universities. Uh, there have been adaptations, but not uh, a transformation in that sense. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so perfect, I think, in, in terms of our time frame. We have uh, quite a uh, deep discussions on uh, three questions. Uh, Peter, do you think you are ready to move on to the next part? Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll continue then. And thank you for the questions. And hopefully we can, um, uh, towards the end, we can come back to some of the issues and maybe also add some, some other comments or reflections to it. Let me then uh, continue with the question about governance because that has become an area in the organizational analysis of universities where we can see a lot of, um, of studies and a lot of uh, focus on organizational change around governance. Uh, and as you all know, uh, the university with at least 900 years of history has uh, survived uh, 860 years without having to use the term management. If you go back in the university history, term management was never uh, um, identified as being uh, of relevance when talking about university. Only the last 40 years or so, you've seen the emergence of the use of the term management in universities. And some uh, scholars even talk about a managerial revolution in higher education. But in essence, uh, this is about how is the university run? Who is in charge? Um, how are decisions made? Um, and in the, the focus on governance, um, there is, of course, and I won't go back in, into the history of the, how, we, how the university is governed. We don't have time for that. And, and other colleagues have already addressed uh, issues there in, in, in this uh, lecture series. But what is of importance and what we also addressed in our article, the, the, the one that Björn Stensack and I um, published some years ago, is that um, the impact of um, the reforms in higher education uh, that were inspired by a new public management and new public management ideas, these impacts um, have been interpreted in, in two uh, different kinds of ways. And the new public management uh, reforms were very much a consequence of developments in the US and the UK in the UK with Margaret Thatcher, and let's not forget that her first uh, political function in the British uh, government was as a minister of education, where she um, uh, tried to uh, introduce far reaching reforms for, for uh, especially the English um, uh, universities. 
and they didn't take it seriously and um, were not that cooperative in implementing the reforms that uh, Margaret Thatcher as Minister of Education introduced. And when she stepped down as Minister of Education, she uh, promised revenge on the universities and she did later. So the uh, new public management approach inspired by um, the um, new ways of thinking of public governance, um, they have uh, led, uh, according to one school in higher education studies, two national higher education systems and the way in which national systems are governed and institutions are governed to convergence. We see fairly homogeneous, supranational, uh, global pressures and uh, common reform agendas, uh, global scripts around autonomy, professional leadership, strategic management, uh, strategic actorhood, the universities needing to find their niche. And according to this school, we've seen this converging trend where um, higher education systems, the governance of higher education systems and the governance of individual universities and colleges becoming more and more alike. At the same time, there are um, uh, colleagues who uh, interpret the developments uh, not as converging, but diverging, uh, identifying national and institutional filters. Um, path dependency uh, plays an important role, but other um, perspectives are also of relevance here, and variations in the way in which national public authorities develop instruments to implement uh, reforms uh, and the way in which these reforms actually are implemented. So while there might be uh, an, a convergence around agenda and the way in which reforms of, for higher education have been <clears throat> introduced and uh, the main aims of the reforms, but the way in which they are implemented and the instruments used leads to divergence. And we can see the divergence also in the ideologies um, that uh, are used uh, in developing new governance modes in higher education. And uh, very generally, and um, there might be alternative uh, ways of, um, of looking at uh, university governance, but very generally, we can identify those countries where there's a lot of emphasis on market forces as um, the, in, in the governance mode for higher education, with an emphasis on the benefits of competition, uh, low levels of public funding, uh, and um, emphasis on tuition fees and other forms of privatization of higher education funding, the need for more direct interactions between higher education and its environment, its clients, and the need for much more use or orientation in research agendas and, and needs-driven uh, uh, funding of, of research. The second ideology uh, has to do with specific national agendas where we can uh, see that governments uh, want to um, uh, control the way in which the institutions are governed. We see a relatively low level of stability in the environments because there are many uh, uh, innovations in higher education policy and in uh, funding uh, introduced with the aim to uh, maximize the contribution that higher education can make to the realization of national agendas and national development goals. And the third group consists of uh, countries where the government tried to balance internal and external control, where public funding levels remain relatively high with low levels of privatization. In some countries, there still is no tuition fee for national students and, and in the EU uh, case also uh, EU students. Um, and where institutional governance combines executive and, and democratic principles. So this is kind of an, an uh, operationalization of this uh, assumption that even though reform agendas have become more alike, the uh, implementation of these agendas have, has not led to a convergence of higher education governance, but to a continuous divergence, if not an intensification um, of this divergence. If we then uh, look at um, innovations in the, um, uh, the way in which higher education governance, both at the system level and at the institutional level, is, is developing, uh, we can see that um, the, an, an, um, an interpretation has emerged, which might be referred to as post-new public management. Um, many scholars begin to argue that the principles, the ideas of no, new public management are outdated, 
and that, uh, for example, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has shown that um, the relatively straightforward narrative that uh, universities uh, function better and perform uh, better and have a higher quality when they diversify uh, funding and move away from a, a high level of public funding to um, more diverse and, and often competitive forms of funding. These kind of relatively simple narratives uh, have um, been challenged in the pandemic, where especially university systems with um, uh, high levels of, of, um, uh, of international students that were paying uh, large amounts of tuition fee, um, there we see the, the problems of the, of the narrative um, in cases uh, of, of, of a crisis like, like the COVID um, uh, pandemic. So what we see now is an interest in, in governance, both at the institutional and uh, the national level, uh, to, uh, to find a better balance between uh, universities being responsive to society's needs and the needs of the economy, but also responsible, take their responsibility uh, with respect to um, uh, dealing uh, and, and addressing issues of climate change, sustainability, etc. Related to that also, how do we balance the uh, economic expectations that in many countries around the world have dominated the discussions around governance and higher education policy? How can we find a better balance between these economic expectations and the various other responsibilities, political, cultural, social, academic, that, that universities that higher education institutions have? And um, how do we uh, deal with um, the disadvantages of uh, market orientation, of com competition in funding and in resources? And how can we develop um, more balanced uh, and um, less one-sided uh, interpretations of, um, of uh, university governance in, in our day and age? So if we take these into account, then um, looking at the transformation of university governance and organization, and I'll, I'll take our study as a starting point, as a, as a frame of reference here, is um, uh, this can be used to, to identify a number of key questions. So what are the features of a hierarchical university governance and organization? And the questions that we, that we uh, addressed um, a few minutes ago, there was clearly um, a recognition of the fact that universities, that governance in university, that the organization has become more hierarchical. But what does it mean? And what are the main features? And to what extent and how are vertical and horizontal coordination challenged in a more hierarchical university uh, organizations? So the, the, um, the centralization of uh, authority in universities, strengthening of central leadership and management leads to coordination challenges because um, the, uh, in the loosely coupled system, the, the relatively independent autonomous units within their knowledge areas um, weren't dependent so much on um, a central institutional leadership and management for their um, um, funding and for other resources. But in the, the new university model, there's an assumption that uh, the, the uh, resource needs of the various units of a university are much more uh, controlled uh, and steered and, and also coordinated by uh, leadership. But um, the um, uh, hierarchicalization of universities, of university governance, brings with it uh, requirements for, for better and, and new forms of, of coordination, both vertical and horizontal. And what are the possible consequences of the challenges with respect to, to these uh, new uh, coordination requirements that we see in universities? So what are main trends and challenges that we have identified? Uh, obviously, um, just to emphasize it again, uh, research intensive universities especially have strengthened governance hierarchies. And these strengthened hierarchies have this dysfunctionalities. And these dysfunctionalities have to do with the, the extent to which university leadership and management can use their expanded um, uh, authority. Um, and um, in this use, there are shortcomings in digital control in report systems. There are shortcomings in the administrative capacity at all levels. And there are shortcomings in the economic resources enabling strategic actions 
in their uh, problems in the interpretation uh, of the role of leadership, which leads in a number of countries. And uh, just to, to mention one example, uh, Denmark, two uh, huge tensions in uh, the higher education system, um, where um, uh, last year in Denmark, uh, thousands of, of academics and, and more students have signed a, a letter, a protest letter, um, um, uh, sent to the minister, the responsible minister of, of higher education, protesting against the way in which the system has developed and the institutional leadership is using its expanded authority. And this has to do with, with these shortcomings and problems. And in essence, what we talk about here, these dysfunctionalities that emerge as a consequence of the fact that the, the um, basic um, uh, conditions for um, uh, operating effectively in a more hierarchical university setting, these basic conditions have not fulfilled. And one of the key issues is coordination problems. All universities have uh, coordination problems and um, they um, are related to the continuation of uh, the loose coupling within universities. So we've identified uh, on the one hand, as part of the uh, growing executive nature of university leadership and management, the, the tendency to standardize, professionalize and specialize uh, management and administrative functions in, in universities. We, we hardly find the um, multi-purpose administrator anymore uh, whom we could go to. And, and most of you are, are probably too young to remember, but I remember the time when we had administrators where with any kind of question you could have, you could go to them and they would always find an answer. Now you have your specialized professional uh, administrators and it's not easy to find out who is responsible for what. At the same time in the academic domain, what we've seen amongst other things uh, because of the uh, changing nature of funding, uh, we have more private uh, or, or non-government um, funding at least, um, there are uh, different types of reporting required and accountability requirements. There are different uh, uh, products or activities that have to be developed. There is a growing need in the academic domain for flexibility, for adaptability and, the, and, and integrative capacity. Um, so how do we see um, the, the way in which universities uh, develop these, these trade-offs between on the one hand this professionalization of management and administration, on the other hand, a greater need for flexibility in the academic domain. Here we see the university governance paradox, where uh, the hierarchy, a more hierarchic form of university governance is accompanied by at least a horizontal decoupling of managerial and administrative uh, specialization, formalization, standardization, um, and professionalization, from the growing need for adaptability and organizational flexibility in, in academic activities. So we see that the, 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 um, the hierarchical development means a new form of loosely coupling, and some would call it decoupling, when it comes to uh, how um, the, uh, the university leadership um, uh, coordinates um, the um, the executive requirements with uh, the uh, the academic um, activities in, in its institution. So some of the conclusions that we reach are that universities have indeed become more complete organizations, but uh, especially in their executive leadership and administrative structure. Because at the same time, productivity and quality of academic activities are still grounded in professional norms that require more flexibility and adaptivity instead of hierarchy, rationality, and organizational identity. And that goes then especially for organizational pr procedures and regulations. So we need more, a more flexible and a more adaptive administration. But what we see is that the administration has become more professional. And one of the interviews that we've done in our study, um, we um, interviewed a prominent professor who had become uh, the academic leader of a new uh, multidisciplinary unit in his uh, university where three faculties were collaborating. And uh, he um, interpreted the developments around um, the hierarchy in institutional leadership and the professionalization of administrations at the leadership in my university and the administration have become more professional but less effective. 
So the restructuring of the academic functions, the academic capacity and the academic workforce in universities has been a process that um, has to a large extent uh, been taking place in the, independent of the developments in the uh, governance and organization of the most productive and prestigious academic activities. So we see a growing uh, decoupling of, on the one hand, the uh, most effective, that is productive and prestigious academic activities within the university. And on the other hand, uh, uh, continuous professionalization of the leadership management and administration. So what we've seen is um, the emergence of the university bureaucracy. There was a question about universities as professional bureaucracies, but in professional bureaucracies, the bureaucracies support uh, the, the, the professional activities uh, at the bottom. But in the university, we see more a university bureaucracy emerging that is more externally oriented in reporting and accountability uh, requirements than that it um, adapts to the professional norms, values and understandings of, of the uh, academic domain of the university. And the university leadership, which is supposed to compensate for the decoupling of the bureaucracy and stimulate uh, coordination, effective coordination, lacks the capacity to do so. So what we see, and these are, uh, sorry for the, for the figures, they, they are relatively simplistic, but what we see in the traditional foundation for university governance and organization is an academic domain where the academic activities are taking place and where the leadership and administrative functions are embedded with a board or a similar um, a structure which links uh, the university to the state. In this traditional way, the leaderships, the academics were primus inter partes. They would uh, voluntarily or, or not voluntarily take a leadership position for three or four years and then go back to their academic um, uh, activities. The academic uh, administration was subservient to the academic staff. So the, the administration was uh, supporting and directly linked to the academic activities. The board had, uh, board had a double role representing the interests of the government and the university and management as a concept was non-existent. But in the new foundation for university governance and uh, organization, we still have the academic domain, but we've seen the emergence of the executive structure where leadership and management and the professional administration are concentrated and where the formal autonomy that the university has gained is interpreted and translated into new structures and new uh, responsibilities and forms of authority. Um, the, the traditional board has been replaced more and more by an executive board with external members and with an, um, a, a growing a strategic role within the university still uh, connected to the state, but with uh, uh, and lots of authorities linked to the board itself. And in the academic domain, we see that the academics uh, are responsible for handling knowledge. The academic administration is concentrated there but uh, the concentrate the academic uh, administration related to the primary processes and framework conditions um, are to a large extent determined by the executive structure. So the, the reporting, the accountability, the, um, uh, the formalization of uh, the accountability function is clearly uh, an, um, an element that you see emerging in the academic domain. So we see the university executive structure with the board, the rectorate, or the presidency, the, the vice chancellor, the, the deans, the leadership, you see the professional administration loosely coupled to academic activities and the academic, academic domain still a loosely coupled system, uh, which is one of the reasons why it's so uh, complicated in the university to uh, develop truly multidisciplinary uh, activities, uh, units, structures, and orientations. That was um, my interpretation of the transformation very briefly within the context of, of the lecture. And I thank you very much for your attention and uh, look forward to your, um, to your next set of questions. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And thank you uh, for your uh, kind of consideration of the, uh, the audience uh, with the Finnish and the Chinese characters. And also thank you for providing the uh, simple illustration about the transition in higher education or university governance. I think it's a simple, but it's very clear to show the, the nature of the change. So I, I share with your observation. But now it's a question time. 
uh, we have a little bit less than 20 minutes for questions. So we already have one. Um, uh, Yu Li Chuan, uh, if you can turn on your mic and then speak to okay. Peter. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, nice to see you. Okay, so as you have referred to about uh, more uh, hierarchy means what means the um, some features to the higher education governance. My question is, um, can you please tell us what's the main features uh, because of the more hierarchy? Yeah. Thank you, Lishwan. Uh, good to see you. Um, and greetings from Oslo. The, um, the uh, hierarchy um, doesn't take place in the, the hierarchy, hierarchization doesn't take place in the same way in every university and in every country. There are different features, possible different aspects emphasized. And you can um, therefore uh, look within your own context at the way in which some uh, principal uh, features of university governance are organized around funding, around decision making, around personnel policies, around the use of digital technologies, around uh, procedures for developing uh, new and adapting existing study programs, uh, procedures for um, applying uh, for external funding, which if you go back in my university 20 years ago, any academic uh, could, uh, with a tenured position could decide him or herself whether to uh, apply to the research council now we need uh, approval uh, at the departmental level and then at the the, the faculty level and for certain uh, programs of the research council even the central university administration has to to come in and and um, um, approve a certain um, uh, academic activity so Overall, in, in simplistic terms, I would say that the hierarchization, so the, the development of a hierarchical, more hierarchical governance structure, what it represents is that um, the administration at various levels has gotten a greater control over the procedures and the conditions under which the academics operate. And there is, in that sense, also a, a short step towards uh, substance, towards content. Uh, towards um, influencing research agendas and influencing research programs uh, of uh, departments, faculties, uh, disciplinary areas. So we are in, let's say, a process where the traditional control of the academics over their own activities um, is, is, I don't want to say threatened because that sounds too negative, but at least it's affected by uh, these uh, reforms around university governance and, and leadership. Okay, thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Peter and uh, Li Chuan. Uh, since there's no question, probably I can take the opportunity also for me to ask something to Peter. Uh, so Peter, you know, I, I'm a fan of institutional theory. I think this is uh, very much uh, because of your influence in Oslo. Uh, of course, you have talked about many perspectives uh, like a past dependency, which is also related to institutional theory, but you have not explicitly uh, mentioning the uh, institutional theory. So my question is, so given the changes or transformations in university governance, uh, how do you think uh, whether, you know, the theory of institutionalism or institutional theory will be more um, in a way powerful in explaining the dynamics in the change or, you know, uh, it's opposite. So I want you to share your reflections on the potential use of institutional theory in analyzing the changes in university uh, governance transformation. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Yoshua, for the question. Um, the um... The issue, what kind of uh, analytical or theoretical perspective uh, to use uh, in this area around university governance and, and organization is, of course, very much dependent on your research problem. So what you are um, investigating, what you are interested in investigating, uh, will also determine which 
uh, theoretical perspective uh, is of relevance uh, for for your um, for your study or your your uh, research work, and that's obvious. I mean, that's something that that um, um, we don't have to discuss. Uh, so, so the question then is, what kind of of research problems or issues uh, would be um, uh, suited for an institutional uh, approach? Um, and there are many examples, and I've given examples, and I referred to our book from 2007, where we um, uh, present an, uh, an uh, institutional theoretical approach to understanding changes in university governance and organization, and also present a research agenda at the end. Uh, also, uh, one of the um, um, scholars um, that is really um, inf that has really been influential in the development of neo institutional theory, he uh, makes this distinction between the macro um, theoretical approaches, the micro theoretical approaches, and the institutional uh, approaches. So, if you are interested in the impact of macro trends uh, on higher education then an institutional theory approach wouldn't be very helpful. If you're interested in a rational actor approach to understand how the behavior of individuals within a university contributes to change, then an institutional theory approach wouldn't be very helpful. But if you want to um, understand, uh, for example, uh, the behavior of, of academics and why are academics, uh, for example, um, uh, so focus on, on um, uh, publication and on um, uh, prestige, where does that come from? Um, so how can we understand the university in between the macro and the micro level uh, theoretical approaches from an institutional perspective? Then there are many issues that are relevant. For example, if uh, also related to the previous question from Li Xuan, this uh, uh, tendency to, um, to introduce more hierarchical forms of university governance and decision making there you can raise the question about the institutionalization to what extent is this an, a trend that's being institutionalized or are there um, let's say counter forces or um, counter developments that undermine the institutionalization of a hierarchical uh, governance um, approach or governance mode in universities and that lead to uh, um, an, um, new forms of governance that aren't hierarchical that are kind of a uh, combination of some hierarchical and some uh, democratic and other elements. Um, so, so question of behavior, of question of um, um, of the robustness of universities. So, why are universities surviving? I mean, their death has been um, announced and predicted, not just uh, in in our days and age, but uh, throughout the century. But the universities are robust, so they have apparently. And that's from an institutional perspective and, and, and a, a relevant um, approach. They apparently have a very strong institutional defense mechanism to deal with uh, external pressures for change that we also can see in the way in which universities manage to combine an academic domain and an executive structure. Um, so um, on the one hand, research questions, research problem will determine whether or not an institutional theory approach uh, can be of relevance. On the other hand, um, institutional theory is, I mean, um, is uh, not one um, relatively straightforward institutional approach, uh, as you've been writing about yourself and, and many others too. Uh, there are um, traditional uh, institutional theory uh, approaches, and there are uh, recent developments around institutional logics, institutional work, discursive institutionalism, etc that uh, try to um, contribute to the challenge that we all face when we want to operationalize institutional theory and use it in empirical research. Because theoretically, um, a focus on institutions makes sense. But in empirical research, it's not always easy to find uh, uh, and to develop an operationalization that allows you to um, uh, do valid uh, empirical research. So I hope that uh, it wasn't really an answer to your question, but I hope that at least it contributed to uh, to the discussion. Yeah, more than answering my question, you have you a broader perspective to look at the relevance of institutional theory, of course, depending on the research uh, question and the inquiry. Um, 
So I think since there's no question, so I take a, still my opportunity. So please ask question, otherwise I'm using your time. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm not moving on to a practical issue, uh, jumping from the uh, theoretical one. Uh, so now, you know, in university, in many universities, you know, uh, we are promoting the uh, interdisciplinary collaboration, establishing interdisciplinary research and education degree programs. Uh, so referring to the two models you have just shown us, the traditional foundation and the new foundation of university government governance. So do you think uh, the, uh, the changes, for example, the transition towards more hierarchical in the university and having a strong executive you know, administration, whether these changes will strengthen the, uh, the development of interdisciplinary uh, programs or, you know, still opposite. So how the new changes in university administration and the governance structure, structures will, will have an impact positively or negatively on the development of interdisciplinary programs in research and teaching. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you, Joshua, for another relevant and important question. The, the interest in and the acknowledgement of the importance of uh, interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary approaches and activities in universities in higher education, that acknowledgement is, is, um, uh, is uh, not uh, recent. We have um, seen um, in um, both government policies, in um, the work of international organizations, in uh, universities, in, in the work of academics, we've seen the, the, the growing understanding that for addressing the key global challenges like uh, climate change, inequality, um, the need for sustainable forms of energy and uh, ways of living, um, demographic uh, uh, challenges, etc. Um, we what we uh, can um, um, uh, identify in this is that the efforts to uh, organize the university in a more interdisciplinary way they face a number of challenges. And I'm not sure whether a more hierarchical university governance approach would would be helpful. Uh, one of the challenges is, of course, that and it's been very um, nicely um, described in, in the literature. Um, is that when the research university emerged uh, in Germany at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, at that time, we also saw the emergence of disciplines and, and disciplinary um, settings, um, associations, journals, etc. And the interesting interpretation of where does the professor or the academic uh, belong, um, before the emergence of the research university, the professor uh, had um, an um, contract with his, and at that time, there were only male, uh, unfortunately, only male uh, academics, but the professor had um, a contract with his university, and that's where the teaching was taking place, and that was it. So the identity of the institution and the professor were uh, neatly uh, connected. But the emergence of the university and disciplines meant that a large part of the uh, identity and the interpretation of status and of quality and of norms, etc., does not take place within the organization where the professor has his or her contract. It's in disciplinary settings. Um, and you, you publish not to your colleagues within your university and other disciplines, but you uh, publish to uh, first and foremost to communicate with your colleagues within your uh, discipline in, in, in specialized uh, journals and, and, and books, etc. So the, the the challenge of the disciplinary organization of the university is linked to the um, disciplinary organization of um, the, the uh, academic profession and, and the knowledge domains. So um, in that sense, a hierarchical, a more hierarchical university governance approach might contribute to breaking through um, these, these settings. And in our study, the study that I referred to, the competition collaboration study, uh, one of the universities that we um, examined had as a, or has as a key feature of its strategic plan and, and the, the, the reorganization of the knowledge domains in the university, breaking the silos of the university. And with that, they meant 
um, moving away from the disciplinary organization of the university and creating a, a, a truly both in uh, study programs and in research um, uh, interdisciplinary uh, university. So in that sense, and that example, and there are other examples, um, uh, you might uh, follow your line of reasoning and say, uh, we cannot break through this disciplinary setting unless we break the silos. And that also means um, reducing the, the not so much the power, but the important role of disciplinary settings in the way that the academic profession is organized. So we shouldn't only think when we think of interdisciplinarity of what happens within the university, but also of how um, young scholars uh, are enrolled in their PhD work and already in their master work in knowledge domains. And that these knowledge domains are still first and foremost disciplinary. Um, so we have to think broadly um, and it's not enough to, uh, to uh, create some multidisciplinary structures, even though many universities are doing so and rightly so. But we have, have to rethink the way in which um, uh, we organize our, our knowledge domains and uh, the way in which uh, this organization and also affects the university as an organization. Yeah. I hope that was at least partly an answer to your question. Yeah, yes. Uh, yeah, actually, you know, my question, yeah, is, uh, uh, only uh, for the hierarchical, you know, the relations be between the new hierarchical structure and the interdisciplinary program development. But actually, as you pointed out, the situation is more complicated. You know, we should look at it from multiple uh, dimensions. So, so very well, I think you have uh, uh, addressed the issues very uh, comprehensively. And also, uh, our time is almost up. So one minute. So I offer a quick uh, question for anybody. If you want to have a quick question, you can raise your hand. Uh, no, probably you have too so sophisticated a question to be addressed in one minute. So otherwise, I think uh, now I we can close it here. Or oh, Peter, if you have anything you want to say as a final word to the audience. Um, yes, well, thank you very much for your attention, and I really appreciate that so many of you have participated, and uh, I wish you all the best in your career or as a student in, in, um, in your studies, and uh, I, uh, if you have any questions uh, with respect to the presentation, uh, then please do not hesitate to, to, uh, to approach me, to get in touch with me. The, my, my email, those of you who don't know it, is at the end of um, the PowerPoint, pre uh, a set of PowerPoint slides that will be made available to all of you by Julia. So thank you for your participation and the, the very interesting questions. Uh, thank you very much for Peter, very inspiring talk and a great contribution. And for audience, thank you for your questions and uh, active participation. Please follow up our next uh, uh, lecture series. I think Julia has posted the link uh, so try to follow us and uh, looking forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.